Well, hey, everyone, welcome, and we're so glad you're with us to worship uh, and to jump into God's Word. We're finishing a series called The Politics of Jesus and looking at Jesus and hope. And you might be thinking, well, what does hope have to do with politics and actually everything? And we'll get to that in a minute. So whether you're joining us on our Facebook page or YouTube channel, on our website, wherever you are, we're just glad you're with us uh, to tune in and discover what God has to say to us. But before we get into the subject matter and the text, I want to just take a minute, I thought it'd be maybe helpful for us to reflect back on all we've experienced, or at least some of what we've experienced over the last 10 to 12 months together. You know, in COVID time, there's such a thing as COVID time, I don't know if you knew that, three days ago can feel like three months ago, and a month ago can feel like a year ago. So let's, let's look back for a minute. Do you remember back in December of 2019, almost a year ago, what was dominating the news then was the impeachment trials. Do you remember this? Every day there was more information and watching the impeachment trials. It was all over the news. It's all we, our nation could think about. And then in late February um, to early March, we heard about this thing uh, called the coronavirus, COVID-19, the novel coronavirus. And we saw lots of these strange images of the virus, what it looks like under a microscope. And it's all anybody talked about. And of course, then soon after that, we had the daily press conferences. Remember Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks and how they'd come out every day and the whole nation hung on their every word? Remember back when we trusted what they said and we felt like we, we had a plan? Those days seem a long time ago now. And then, of course, there was the testing, the fear about COVID-19 testing and swabs and ventilators and face shields and PPE and all of that information. Uh, and then, of course, masks, the, the worry about masks and kids in school and are the masks helpful or not helpful and should we wear them or not wear them and what about kids in school? And then... In, a, in May of 2020, just, just past May, in Minnesota, an African-American man named George Floyd was killed when a police officer knelt on his neck for eight minutes. And he wasn't the first black life to be lost. He came after Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor. And there were protests breaking out in cities all across our nation, everywhere it seemed like. People protesting, screaming out against the racism and racial violence, calling for an end to it. And then we saw those protests turn uh, into riots and looting in certain places. And the message of justice seemed to be lost in all of that. We saw riots and looting happening. And then as if it were to give us a, a calming influence, maybe to bring us back to some sanity, we had a presidential debate. Remember the first presidential debate? Remember how soothing and civil that was? Remember how we all came out of that feeling like, ah, there's hope in the world? Eh, maybe not so much. And then, of course, after that, just recently, we had the election, election night, which turned into election week, which is turning into election month, of course. And I remember one young man asked his mom, and she told me the story. He said to her, mom, why do you watch that weird map show every night? Because <laughs> it's the same thing every night. Oh, and in case you forgot, while all this was going on, half of the West Coast seemed to be burning in fires. Do you remember that as well? Well, with all of this in mind, let me ask you a question. Is the world getting better or is it getting worse? What do you think? Is the world getting better or getting worse? In fact, if you're with some friends or family, answer, what do you think right now? Or maybe you could just let us know in the comment section, better or worse? Which direction is the world headed? Do you know that 70% of Americans answer that question, worse? The world is getting worse. And obviously, when you look at the images we just put up there, selected images, it does feel like, yeah, it's obvious. Things are getting much worse. But Johann Norberg uh, wrote a book called Progress, and then an atheist philosopher named Steven Pinker picked up on that idea and wrote a book called Enlightenment Now. And the, here's their basic thesis, which is gaining traction. They say, they make the very compelling case that by any objective metric, the world is better now than it has ever been before. If you look at sanitation, life expectancy, poverty rates, violence, literacy, freedom, equality, by these metrics, the world has never been better than it is right now. And they make a very compelling data-driven argument for that. If that's true, why do so few of us feel that way? Anxiety, depression, mental illness are at near epidemic levels in our country. So which is it? Are we headed toward... A Hunger Games reality or a Hallmark Christmas movie reality? Where are we headed? Well, in a sense, I think you could make the argument that we're at the same time progressing materially and technologically, but regressing emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. The point is that we live in this tension between these two different narratives 
about the world. So what do we do? Soren Kierkegaard, Danish uh, philosopher, said, life must be lived forward, but it can only be understood by looking backward. You can't live in reverse. You have to live going forward, but you can only understand your life going forward by understanding where you've come from. I think that's true. And the passage we're going to examine from Romans chapter 8 does just that. It helps us look backward so that we can live forward. So if you've got your Bible, you can turn with me and we'll read through Romans chapter 8. In fact, I'm going to read it on our amazing new screen. I'm excited about this sermon, mostly because of this passage, but also because this is really cool. Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is such an incredible passage. We couldn't possibly plumb the depths of it in one sermon. But at the most basic level, this is a passage about hope. It's rich and it's amazing and it's many layered, but centrally it's about hope. Hope is inescapable. We cannot live without hope. Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel wrote a series of books called The Night Trilogy, and one of his central quotes is that human beings are irreducibly hope-based creatures. Viktor Frankl, another Holocaust survivor, wrote about, wrote about this and said, those who fared the best under Nazi prison camps were those who had hope in a better future. Those who became hopeless died quickly. And every election cycle... Hope takes center stage. In fact, when President Obama was running for office, hope was the word of his campaign. But you hear it and feel it in every election slogan, every campaign slogan, every stump speech. They're peddling hope. Put your hope in this policy. Put your hope in this platform. Put your hope in this person to make things better. Now, I've seen Christians say certain things like, our only hope right now is to get the election results reversed to keep Trump in office. And I've also heard Christians say things like this when it looked like President Trump was going to lose. Uh, for the first time in four years, I finally feel hopeful. Here's what I want to say to both statements. Your hope is badly misplaced. It's badly misplaced. If our hope is not in getting election results reversed, and if you're feeling hopeful for the first time in four years, you've been missing out on your true hope for four years. Hope is a longing and a desire for a preferable future, but it's because, of course, who hopes for things to get worse? But biblical hope is more than just our desires. In fact, there's such a thing as false hope or vain hope. Psalm 33, verses 17 through 18 says this, the war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. The war horse, for all his strength, cannot save you. It's a vain or a false hope. Our culture is full of false hopes. People putting their hope in all the wrong things. For example, I hope that the Bears' offense can miraculously be fixed in this bye week. But I'm telling you, I think that's a vain hope and a false hope. Ultimately speaking, what you place your hope in, your desire for a preferable future, goes to the kind of person you're becoming. Because what you hope for, your believed in future, determines how you live right now. Or to put it another way, how you live today is largely determined by how you think about tomorrow. And this is what Romans chapter 8 is all about. It's about hope. Now, a little background, a little context here to help us set the stage for what Paul is really saying. Now, this is where it gets really cool. 
Uh, I'll give you a little drawing here, illustration to, to talk about how Paul, before he became Paul, who wrote the New Testament, most of it, was Saul. And Saul was a rabbi. He was a Jewish scholar. And to the Jewish mind, worldview, the human history was seen in two ages. There's this present age and the age to come. Whoops. Look at that. And the age to come. So first there's this present age. And then the age to come. Now the present age is marked by injustice, oppression, violence, war, uh, um, uh, you know, abuse, and natural disasters and diseases, all the things we're experiencing and seeing in our world. And the age to come is essentially the opposite. It's harmony and prosperity and peace, the full shalom of God, when history reaches its glorious climax in the reign of God among his people. And between these two ages, to the Jewish mind, was Yom Yahweh, or the day of the Lord. History is moving in this direction to the Jewish mind. The present age and all of its problems and, 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 and injustice will come to the day of the Lord, at which point all humanity will be resurrected and the age to come is ushered in. So when Paul talks in Romans 8 about what's to come, he's playing off this Jewish worldview because the Jews expected a, at the end of history, a resurrection of all humanity. But what they got was in the midst of all of human history, the resurrection of one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so, actually, Paul is painting for us a, a, a different picture. The Christian worldview is different than this one. I know you're impressed with this, this board, as am I. It looks like this. That the present age and the age to come actually overlap. And that Christ, his death and resurrection and ascension, that stands at the center. This, and history is actually moving in this direction in a sense. Jesus is bringing the age to come into the present age. And we live in the overlap of these two ages. That's what Romans 8 is really all about. Uh, in fact, the resurrection is the turning point in human history. It's what J.R. Tolkien calls the eucatastrophe. You ever heard that word before? E-U, the Greek prefix for good, catastrophe. The good catastrophe? Yes, that sudden surprising turn for the good, which nobody saw coming, but it moves you. He says a, a eucatastrophe is the sudden happy turn in the story that pierces you with joy and brings you to tears. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the ultimate eucatastrophe in human history. So it's not that the earth is going to burn up and we all sail away somewhere. It's that Christ, by his death and resurrection, is bringing the new kingdom, the age to come, into this present age, restoring and renewing all things. So the first thing we want to see here in this passage is hope as longing. Hope as longing. Paul's talking about a longing we have. Now the word Paul uses for longing is the word we say translate in English as groan or groaning. The Greek word is stenazo. It means an inward groaning that expresses both grief and pain and expectation or desire. A groaning of desire as well as grief. We experience the ache and the groan of unfulfilled desires in this life. And this is true for all of us. It doesn't matter how good your life is, how good you've had it. All of us know this ache and this groan, this, this longing for it to be different than it is. We, we, we know life should be different than it is. We long for it to be different. We, we groan over past failures and pains. We groan over present injustices. And we groan for what we long for, what's to come. We cannot stop human evil and suffering. We can mitigate it to a degree with all of our technolo technology and advances, but we can't eliminate it. And despite what our politicians tell us or promise us, this is fundamentally true. And one of the lessons I think this season of COVID is teaching us is reminding us that human suffering and evil is a reality in which we live and we cannot eliminate it. Now, let's go back for just a minute uh, to uh, verses 18 through 21. I want you to look at a couple words here. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. That is to, to be revealed. Something is coming. 
present time, present age, to be revealed, age to come. There's the two ages. For the creation waits with eager, do you see this? Eager longing. An eager longing for what's to come, for the revealing of the sons of God. And then he says, we'll be set free from our bondage. And there's two other phrases here. Subjected to futility and bondage to corruption. These words, futility and corruption, are talking about sin. Our fundamental problem, the real issue we all have. You see, according to the Bible and Paul, our primary problem in the world is not liberalism, it's not conservatism, it's not socialism, it's not Marxism, it's not communism, it's not racism, fascism, sexism, nationalism, or any other kind of ism. These are just symptoms of the disease. And the disease is sin, the human condition. And this is why we groan. This is where the groaning really comes from. And therefore, the right policy or party or candidate can never solve the fundamental human condition. Jordan Peterson, evolutionary psychologist, writes, if society is corrupt, but not the individuals within it, then where is the corruption, where does it originate, and how does it propagate? What he's saying is the common view in the secular world is society is corrupt, but people are basically good. But society is made up of people. In other words, something is off. Something is wrong, not just out there, but in here. This is fundamental to what Romans 8 is teaching us. So many people I talk to today and I hear want to be a part of changing the world. Many people have come to Chapel Street and they like what we're doing in the community. They care about loving their neighbor and they want to be a part of making the world a better place. And they want to be about you know, saving the world, the planet, other people. But fundamentally, we need to be saved. We are not saviors. Only Christ is. I need to be forgiven. I need to be redeemed. I need to be cleansed, and so do you. And this is why in the text it says, the creation was subjected not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, meaning us. The rocks and the trees didn't rebel against God and sin against God. We did. And when we did, something shifted in all creation. And that's why we groan. And creation groans with us. In other words, our rebellion had cosmic consequences. Let's move on. Hope as knowing. Hope as knowing. Now, you might think knowing, isn't hope and knowing, those are, that sounds like an oxymoron because hope means it might happen, it might not happen. How do you know? Actually, biblically speaking, there's the certainty related to Christian hope. Our groaning is a kind of hope because we don't just groan over what's happened in the past or what's happening in the present. We groan in expectation of what we know is to come and what we long for. Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It's a confidence. It's knowing something for sure. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 tells us that we have this hope, the hope of Christ, as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. In chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews says that we should hold unswervingly to the hope we profess because he who promised is faithful. Now, this is a radical concept. Most who don't know Jesus don't get this. It feels overconfident and arrogant to say, how can you know? And to be honest, there are a lot of things we don't know in the world. I don't know what 2021 is going to hold. I don't know what will happen with our government over the next four years. I don't know what's going to happen with the economy. I don't know if the vaccines really are 95 or 90% effective and when we'll have them. There's a lot I don't know. But ultimately speaking, we know. We know. We know what? We know that God is real. We know that God is good. We know that God is sovereign. We know that God is with us. We know that God is in control. We know that God sent his son into this world. We know that Christ did die. He did rise. He did ascend. And he will return. We know. And this, Paul says, is the hope into which you were saved. That which you know. And this impacts how we live today. How we live now. Let's look at uh, verses 22 through 24 again of the text. Right here, Paul says, For we know that the whole creation has been growing together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, right? So it's not just out there, it's also in here. Creation groans and we groan together because we know something is happening. Now, Paul uses a fascinating phrase here in this passage. He says, Together in the pains 
of childbirth. This is shocking, if you think about it. Paul is inviting us to see the world as a world in labor, meaning something is being birthed. Something is coming. It's not pointless suffering. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's agony. Yes, there's, there are problems. But they're not without hope. They're not without promise. We groan because we know it ought to be different and because we know someday it will be different. Listen to what uh, author, theologian, scholar N.T. Wright says about this in his book, Surprised by Hope. It's one of my favorite books, one of the best books I've read on this subject. The resurrection of Jesus declared that Jesus was not the ordinary sort of political king, a rebel leader that some had supposed. He was the leader of a far larger, more radical revolution than anyone had ever supposed. He was inaugurating a whole new world, a new creation, a new way of being human. He was forging a way into a new cosmos, a new era, a form of existence hinted at all along, but never before unveiled. Here it is, he was saying. This is the new creation you've been waiting for. It is open for business. Come and join in. Oh, I love that. Isn't that good? That's Romans 8 language he's giving us. This is that which we know. So hope first is our longing, longing for what is to come, yearning and groaning over the pain of the past, over the injustice in the present, but also knowing something's coming. And that, what we long for, is something that's certain to us. And the certainty is anchored in the resurrection of Jesus. It's not a wish dream. It's not, oh, I hope this works out. It's a rock-solid certainty. And so we groan for it. We know it should be different than it is. This brings us finally to hope as waiting. Hope as waiting. Most of us don't think of waiting as a good thing. I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. I don't enjoy waiting. Have you ever been to the DMV? How many of you have been to the DMV and thought, Oh, this is good for me. This is biblical hope in action. I get to wait and practice my expectancy. No, we don't think that way. Or if you, I think there's a lot of waiting going on now because apparently there's another run on toilet paper. Didn't we go through this already six months ago, seven months ago? Didn't we learn, world, society, that we're not going to run out of toilet paper? But anyway, we're back there again. But the biblical concept of hope is closely tied to waiting. In fact, in, in Spanish, in the Spanish language, the word for hope and the word for wait are the same root, espera. And so in, in, in Greek, uh, the language Paul was writing in, they're not the same word, but the same concept. It means to wait with eager expectation. This is what Paul's saying. We hope and we wait. Now, let's look at verses 24 and 25, or 25 again. Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This does not mean we sit around doing nothing. To the Christian, waiting is not passive. It's not just sitting, you know, on the couch for God to show up and change it all. In fact, biblical hope and waiting is actually active. When we serve, when we share, when we witness, when we worship, when we forgive, we are putting our hope into practice. We're demonstrating to the world that we are people of hope. Let's go back for just a minute to that image. And remember, Paul is locating us in this picture here. He's putting us in place. Now I'm just showing off for you. He's saying this is where we live. We live here in what one scholar has called the time between the times. And he's locating all of our groaning and our hoping in this place that we experience some of the pain of the, of the present age, and we also get glimpses of the age to come. And so our waiting is active. We're, we're working for the kingdom of God, even though it's not fully realized yet, even though it is still to come. This is evidence of where our hope resides. So for all of us, the way we practice hope is not just sitting around sort of, you know, detached hoping but get engaged in the kingdom of God, the business of the kingdom of God, loving our neighbor, serving our neighbor, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, forgiving those who wrong us, extending grace, demonstrating that we are people of a hope that's beyond political party, beyond any current moment in history. It's anchored somewhere far beyond in what is to come. Two years ago at our Christmas concert, we chose the theme worthy based on an Andrew Peterson hymn of the title, Is He Worthy? I've been listening to that hymn, and Pastor Kenton 
organized the whole concert around that theme, and it was so moving to me. I've loved that song ever since. And if you know the song, you'll know that the, a big portion of it is this call and response where he asks questions and a choir responds with answers. So I'm going to invite you as I ask the questions for you to answer out loud right where you are with friends, with family, or by yourself. I'm going to ask you a series of questions right from this hymn, Is He Worthy? And you can answer. So the, I'll ask the question, you give the answer. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? And does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. He does. Perhaps this week you'll say or sing those questions and answers to yourself and remind yourself of where your hope truly lies. Oh, friends, we need this message more than ever. Let's be people of hope, hopeful people in the world, a world starving for hope and looking for it in all the wrong places. Let's point them by our words and our lives to where hope truly resides. Let's pray. Father in heaven, forgive us for all our vain hopes. Forgive us for looking in the wrong places and affixing our hearts to the wrong people and platforms and policies and purposes. Detach our hearts from all these false hopes, Lord, and tie them firmly, completely, permanently to your son, Jesus. For in him we hope. In him we have hope. He is our hope. God, help us by your grace and your spirit that when we experience the groans of past pains, the groans of present injustices, that we would see that those are not pains without purpose, that you are bringing something into this world, something only you can do, and that we do live in the in-between time and we long for your kingdom to come. But between this day and that day, we will hope only in you, Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.